Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. Today I'm going to be doing a October and November wrap up. And now you may be thinking, that's two months. Must be a pretty big stack of books, am I right? And the answer is no. It's only these three. Two novels and some poems are what I read and then I'm also going to talk a little bit about the books that I'm currently reading but I'm not gonna go too in depth into those. Pretty much this is just sharing my reading over the course of two months, which has consisted of two novels and a poetry book, which when I think about it actually kind of ends up being a little bit funny. I don't know, because I feel like if you're just out and about in the general population, like this is probably still an above average amount to be reading. In within two months, just given the realities of the state of reading today, if people don't really read. But I don't know, I make content surrounding books and so every time I have slower reading months, I feel like a sense of guilt around that, but I'm trying to be better because these past two months were very, very busy for a very specific reason. I was working on some things that are now over, and so I will actually have time to read things that I would like to read in December, which is exciting. But these past two months have been incredibly incredibly busy and you may have been able to notice in my videos that i haven't been doing like reading vlogs or really talking about things that i'm reading and it's just because i haven't really had the mental space or the ability to prioritize reading right now but i will be able to in december which i am very excited about but thanks for bearing with me these are the three books that i've read in the past two months and I'm going to talk about them. The first one that I'm going to get out of the way because it is not technically a book but it is a collection of poetry, Robert Frost poems. I didn't actually read all of them but I did read selections of them. I was inspired by my New England road trip to read some of Robert Frost poems because the poetry of Robert Frost is very, you can tell that he's a New Englander. It, a lot of it is just grounded in New England landscapes and so reading this after going on a road trip through New England was just the perfect combination in my opinion. But I will say that I do think I wrote off Robert Frost a bit sooner than I should have. I used to be someone that was like, I don't like nature poems. I don't want to read nature poems. But I live reacted to some of these poems in a vlog. I will link that vlog down below. And actually found some that I, I mean, I don't consider them favorites right off the bat, but that I really, really do enjoy. And I can definitely see Robert Frost becoming a poet that I really end up liking in the future. One I think that was my favorite was Fire and Ice. And then I also really liked the classic ones, the famous ones, The Road Not Taken and Nothing Gold Can Stay. But overall, I found myself really enjoying Robert Frost's narrative voice. And I found that it wasn't just boring nature poems, you know? I don't know if that makes sense where I'm going with that, but it wasn't the nature poems that I thought they were going to be. I actually ended up really liking them. The next book that is honestly the reason why I'm filming this video at all for three videos, because usually I would just skip it, but I did want to talk about the fact that I did read The Daughter of Dr. Moreau by Silvia Moreno Garcia, which is the book that I was so, so excited for for like a year. I feel like ever since the cover art for this got announced, not even the cover art, the title, ever since the title for this got announced, I was hyped. I was so excited. I voiced my excitement about it. As the daughter of Dr. Moreau, immediately in my mind, I was like, oh, she's doing a retelling of the island of Dr. Moreau. And she is. That pretty much is what this is. Although I wouldn't call it just a simple retelling. It's more of a reimagining of the island of Dr. Moreau, which is a classic sci-fi novel by H.G. Wells that I really, really love. And I feel like I should say a little bit what the H.G. Wells novel follows in order to give this a fair like summary perhaps. The Island of Dr. Moreau follows this man. I never remember the names of H.G. Wells' narrators because I don't know, I just never do. But this man goes to this island, which is Dr. Moreau's island, and he soon discovers that Dr. Moreau has been conducting cruel experiments on animals to make them more human-like. And these are very cruel experiments. The animals are in pain and it progresses from there. And now the daughter of Dr. Moreau follows Carlota, who is the daughter of Dr. Moreau. In H.G. Wells' original novel, there is no daughter of Dr. Moreau, but this one follows Carlota. And she is living on, it's not actually an island, it's the Yucatan Peninsula, but I think in the author's note it said that the peninsula can feel like an island or something like that, but it's not an island. It's the Yucatan Peninsula of Mexico. And so that is where she is. It's a very like secluded place. It's secluded from the cities of Merida and Mexico City. She is on this peninsula with her father living with these hybrids. And 
Immediately when we open, it's different from the island of Dr. Moreau because the hybrids are like living with the family. They're almost like a member of the family. Some of them, not all of them, but immediately we see that she has, there's one hybrid who is like her sister. She is heavily involved in the care of the hybrids in terms of medicine and distributing certain things. And so it's already quite different from the island of Dr. Moreau. And what this follows is what happens when outsiders sort of come into this circle, a couple of different ones, Montgomery, who ends up working for the doctor, and then when a group of young men come and begin to court Carlota. And so it follows that. I think you might be able to tell that it's a little bit hard for me to say what it follows, and that's partly my issue with this book. And it's kind of the issue I end up having with a lot of Garcia's work, I think. It's sort of the issue I had with Mexican Gothic. And I do want to say that I still really enjoyed this book. I still really liked Mexican Gothic, although it wasn't really my favorite. But I always get hooked into these books because of the concept. I'm like daughter of Dr. Moreau. It's the island of Dr. Moreau, but set in the Yucatan. Of course I want to read it. Mexican Gothic? Oh my gosh, that sounds so cool. And then I start reading it and the plot gets lost on me sometimes and I think it's a partly a pacing issue and it's partly a plot issue. I don't know but there were aspects of this that I really really enjoyed. I've talked about how I think that religion plays heavily into the island of Dr. Moreau and I will link that video down below but this book really played up that aspect in the way that the doctor held mass for the hybrids and was acting as if he was their savior and saying that pain is the key to religious salvation etc all these things that he was saying at these mass ceremonies that they do every week for the hybrids. And so this book really played up that which I liked. I also really liked the exploration of Carlota's identity and her sort of finding her sense of self and being able to assert a sense of independence apart from her father because in the beginning she is sort of kept to be very obedient. She is an obedient daughter. That is her role but we see her break out of that as the novel progresses and I really liked it. There were a lot of aspects that I liked about this book. The only issue that I had I think was the pacing that made me sort of question aspects of the plot sometimes. So overall, I would still recommend it because I did have a really good time reading it. I still really like Silvia Moreno Garcia. I still probably will buy all of her new releases. Actually, I haven't been buying all of her new releases, but I will buy some of them. And I'm glad I have this. Probably would reread it in the future because I will never say no to a reread, but it wasn't my favorite and I don't think it was everything I wanted it to be. And the next book that I read, which was an October read, I did an entire read along about this. It is The Shining by Stephen King, which follows the Torrance family. So Jack Torrance gets hired to be the winter caretaker at a hotel in Colorado. And basically he's the caretaker when the weather is so awful that no guests would come. Everything is snowed in. They are essentially trapped in this hotel for the winter and Jack has to be the caretaker of this hotel. And he has a wife, Wendy, and a son, Danny. And Danny Torrance is special because he can shine, which basically means that he can like feel other people's thoughts and emotions. And he has this, this gift to be able to do that. He can also see the future sometimes, and that is his ability. And I talked about this extensively throughout my updates while reading this, but I really liked this. I think rather than a horror book, it's more so an exploration of family and generational trauma. It's an exploration of what isolation can do to people. It's an exploration of addiction and it's an exploration of abusive relationships. I think there's a lot of psychological exploration in this that I wasn't really expecting, although maybe I should, having read a couple of Stephen King's before, actually maybe just two, but it seems like I'm always expecting Stephen King to be really scary and really like freak me out. And then what it ends up being is something that's scary in a different way because it's horror in the way that it's dealing with psychological horror and trauma and all of these very serious themes that go beyond just jump scares. And so every time I read a Stephen King, I like expect them to be jump scares. And then you read it, which is like 1500 pages. And you're like, how could this possibly be about a clown? And it ends up being about childhood and the special magic of childhood and the difference between child and adults and etc. This one was about, again, generational trauma, the attempt to break generational cyclical trauma, sort of what happens when you are forced to confront all of these issues that you've been suppressing. That's what this follows. And it sort of follows Jack 
as he slowly starts to unravel within this hotel and how his family deals with that. Saying any more than that is probably a spoiler. Also, I feel like this has steeped into popular culture a lot, so you might know a bit more about The Shining. I will say, however, that I watched the movie. This might be one of the most controversial things I've said on this channel. I don't know, but I don't know about the movie, my friends. I, I liked it, but it just gave me more of the jump scares instead of like the psychological thriller that this gave me. And so I think I prefer the book. I was expecting a bit more from the movie, honestly, because Misery as a movie, top-notch, incredible. I love it so much. I don't know if The Shining did it for me. Let me know if you agree. Again, that might be like the most controversial thing I've said on this channel. I don't know. But overall, I really enjoyed The Shining. It's not my favorite King. I think Misery firmly remains my favorite Stephen King, but I had a great time reading it. And I'm actually glad that it wasn't just jump scares because honestly, that can only be interesting for so long. And so I really enjoyed King's exploration of the themes that he was interested in. So those are my thoughts on The Shining. In terms of books that are in progress, I have three. Haven't been vlogging because they've been very sporadic and you will probably be able to see why the first one I hold up, which is A Passage to India by E.M. Forster. I started this Labor Day weekend, put it in my Labor Day weekend vlog. I have not finished it, but I'm hoping to in December. I also have two crime fiction books. I have Night Over Mexico by Todd Downing, and I have The Little Death by Michael Nava. Not far enough to say what either of these are about, but I'm just going to say the inspiration that caused me to pick them up. Maybe we'll see these in a vlog or we'll just see them in the future because I am going to finish these in December. Night Over Mexico is pretty much just because I took two crime fiction classes with the same professor and then I wasn't able to take his next one because I graduated and I asked him to send me the book list. This was on the book list and so I'm reading it now. The next one is because I was looking up Chicano classics and this one came up, The Little Death by Michael Nava, as a classic of Chicano hard-boiled detective fiction and pretty much that Michael Nava has been likened to Dash Ohama and Raymond Chandler and so I was like, absolutely gonna pick it up, gonna read it right now. And so those are the two other ones that I'm reading and those are the sort of what led me to pick them up. But I think that is going to be it for this video. This actually ended up being quite a long video for me being like, I didn't read anything at all, but I just had a lot to say, I guess. But anyway, thank you so much for watching. Thank you for bearing with me within these past two months where reading has honestly crawled to an almost halt and I will see you in the next video.